yeah, I'm Anna Green. I'm a partner at the talent business. Um, so we've been running for about 25 years now. Uh, and there's about 65 of us uh, based across the world with London being our main office. Um, my first job when I left uni was at a startup tech platform, which was all around helping grads get their first job. So this is something that I've, I've always had a passion for and I've always been involved in. Um, and I've been creative, creative headhunting for about um, five years now, with three of those at the talent business. Um, at the talent business, I look after midway to sort of CD and ECD level talent, um, primarily in London, but also across Europe as well. Um, and I run Cream, which a few of you will know about, um, which is our annual creative competition. Um, and this year it's been the Cream Collective. So the sort of key areas I'm going to talk about is um, current trends. So what's been happening in the industry, in the market over the last couple of years? What's been happening this year, which is obviously a bit of an anomaly. Um, I'm going to talk about increasing your chances of landing a job, um, which will include your portfolio, how to spot opportunities um, and upskilling as well, because we've all got a bit of extra time. So if there's anything you can do in this period to increase your chances, I'll cover that off. Um, payments and salaries. So how, how much you should be looking to get paid and how to negotiate that. And then also contracts and IP, which sounds scarier than it is. And I'll break it down for you so that'll be fine. And then I'll just a few key takeaways at the end. So let's get going. So over the last few years, um, the kinds of trends we've been seeing, it can all be summarized by essentially clients wanting more bang for their buck. Um, they want better results for less money. Um, so we've seen a rise in in-house agencies. So this is brands setting up small creative departments within their own company so they're not outsourcing work to agencies as much um, and the kinds of people that have been doing this has ranged vastly from someone like bbc creative they're about five years old nikes amazon um, right down to small brands like heist uh, and like patch plants so everyone's been sort of rushing to try and set up a creative in um, creative agency within themselves um, there's also been quite a lot of um, project by project work, which means agencies have less retained business um, and they're driving down agency rates. Um, and there's been a massive spend on um, digital and social content, which has been moving budget away from sort of traditional media um, as well. And they've been getting good results for it. So I think that's a trend that we'll see going forward. But yeah, this is all basically about clients wanting to get more for their money. Um, so that's what we've seen over the last couple of years. And then going into this year, up to now, it's been very different, um, which I'll talk about. But this sort of summarizes where we're at as an industry at the moment. So this is some of our clients that we, that we work with. Um, about 10 years ago, this would have been 100% agency. And now you can see that it's not the case at all. So there's all different people on, people on here, um, all hiring creatives. So you've got people from consultancies to publishers to broadcasters, banks, um, commercial goods. They're all start setting up inside um, a creative, creative agency inside themselves, media agencies. So this should be really heartening for you. Like this is diversification of our industry essentially and you could go and sit and do a creative job in nearly all of these um, so this is really positive I want you to be positive about this side um, but look so this year has been a tough one um, initially when the furlough scheme started we saw lots of furloughing of staff across the board uh, and that was agencies and brands alike um, and at every level you know, from placement teams being furloughed right up to creative directors being furloughed. So everyone was in the same boat. Um, initially, so sort of back in March and April, there were quite a few redundancies as well. A majority of these were at a, sen a really senior level. So like global CCO, um, a global ECD, that kind of level. Um, and holding groups have been really aggressive with this. Um, so some holding groups didn't even furlough people. They've just been making people redundant, which is quite scary. But I think that we're getting to the end of it. So people should be in a position to start to reshape a little bit. Um, obviously, people haven't really been hiring up to this point. 
just because they've got people on furlough they need to bring back before they think about bringing anyone else in. Um, as like a general trend, I would say that independents, so smaller agencies and then in-house um, has been slightly less affected. Um, but everyone's definitely felt the crunch of Corona. Um, and there's been really, really big account losses. Um, so a lot of pitching going on, you know, just in the last few weeks, we've obviously had walkers, we've had three, we've had hotels.com, we've had Mars. So really, really chunky bits of business has been on the move. Um, so look, there are a few obstacles we've got to overcome this year. You know, if you're graduating, if you're just looking to get, you know, into the market as a junior, it's a little bit trickier than it has been in previous years, but that's okay. Cause we're going to talk about things and tools we can use to try and try and at least increase our chances of getting in somewhere. Um, so we're going to start a journey, right? So we're going to start from where you are now and we're going to go right up until you being hired at that agency as a junior creative. So the first step on our journey is your portfolio. So, I want you to sort of use this as a bit of a checklist. A lot of you will already have your book in a position where it's ready to send out. So these are just some things that you can think about and make sure you have in there. Um, you know, sections in your portfolio, a lot of people ask me about. So I think keep it super simple and have four. You know, work, personal projects, we can also call side hustles, which I'll talk about in a second, um, about and contact. And that's kind of all you need. Um, when you're looking at your work, I definitely organize it into campaigns rather than media, so it looks really well rounded. Um, and I think realistically, when people go through your portfolio, they'll probably look at about three pieces of your work and then they'll go to your about section. So it's a lot more important than you think it is. Um, and make sure if we found your book, we can then find you. So have your contact details in there, have your full name. Um, links to social media pages if they're appropriate so things like your LinkedIn your Instagram your Twitter um, if you've won any awards pop them in there um, history of placements also if you've had internships you know anything that you can show um, you know any, any experience you've had that could be beneficial pop that in here as well and then tell us something about yourself like what makes you tick what makes you slightly different from the person the other the other book i've just looked at you know i want to know you um and i touched briefly on it in them but side hustles has definitely been like i thought it was a flavor of the month but it's been a flavor of the last few years actually um these are just a really good way of you showing that you are inherently creative and it's more than a nine to five job to you um it could literally be anything I've had people, I've had writers who have put short stories on there and poems and photography. Um, some people put comedy, which can be is the varying success, I think. So unless you're really, really good at comedy, maybe don't put that one on. Um, but look, it's just a really good way, another way of an ECD or CD getting to know you a little bit better um, and showing that you're a maker. People always, always ask me, for makers, and this is a good way of showing you that. Um, but look, your work is still the most important thing, so don't get too hung up on this, and this should be, once you're, you're happy with all the ideas and all the work you have in your portfolio, then let's think about this. Okay, so let's get back to our journey. We have a banging book, we've got some side hustles on there, but who are we gonna approach? It's um, the scattergun approaching everyone is exhausting. It's emotionally exhausting for you guys. Um, and it doesn't bring up the best results. So especially this year, we need to be a little bit cleverer with deciding who we're going to start to approach. Um, and we need to know what agencies or what businesses might be in a position to hire. So the easiest way of doing this that I'm gonna show you is using Twitter. So um, industry news, every, all, all industry news outlets have a Twitter account. And I've picked campaign as an example, um, but you could also use people like um, Little Black Book. They're really good and they're free. Um, campaign 
is quite expensive. That's why I've used it for the Twitter account. Um, but you can also get on there if you go on incognito mode on Chrome. Um, so you can read the full articles. But we're literally just going to use these four tweets and we're going to get leads um, out of it and we're going to decide who might be good to approach for a placement or a job at the moment. So the first two tweets I've chosen are pitch updates. So these are my favorite. So these can give us a whole load of information. And it's literally, what is that? Five words, that Dorito tweet. Um, and this is all the information we can get from it. So this tells us that AMV have lost the Doritos account, which is actually part of the Walkers account, which they've lost. Um, and if you didn't know that, you can literally Google that sentence. Who has the Doritos account, UK advertising account, and AMV pops up. So you know that it might not be the best time to approach A and B. They could be making redundancies. That's a big chunk of money that's, that they've just lost. Um, you know that there's a pitch happening. And if you know there's a pitch happening, you know that other agencies are pitching for that business. So can you, can you approach those agencies who are pitching for some freelance? They might need some freelance help. Um, and who also whoever wins that account might be hiring because it's a chunky piece of money. Um, which might lead to them staffing up. So out of those five words, we've got all of that information. Um, and then the second one here as well is another pitch update. So it's about three. Um, so this is about Widen's. So Widen's losing three. Maybe they're not in the best position to hire right now. I'm not saying never approach these agencies and just saying maybe they could be in a few months' time. Um, so again, we know that the people involved might need freelance help and then whoever wins it is probably going to be hiring. So these two tweets have given us all of that information and can help us be a bit targeted on who we're going to approach. These two are a little bit trickier. Um, but so L'Oreal boosts digital share of marketing spend from 50% to 70%. So that's interesting for us because L'Oreal's digital agency whoever that might be, again, we can Google, um, have probably just got an influx of a bit of cash. So they might be in the market to hire a junior creative or a placement team. Um, the agency who does the above the line advertising have obviously just lost a bit of cash. So could they be scaling back? Maybe I'll approach them in a few months, not right now. Um, and this is interesting because it also tells us a trend of clients investing heavily in digital which is one of the things I'm going to talk about in upskilling. And this last one, so Accenture Interactively, uh, Interactive, significantly impacted by Corona slump. So Accenture Interactive is a holding group, which I'm going to chat about next. Um, but holding groups essentially are families of agencies. So they're saying that their family might be not be having the best time at the moment, um, which we could infer maybe Droga, Kamrama and Fjord, who are in that family. Um, maybe making redundancies or at least have hiring freezes. So again, maybe they're not right for us to approach right now. Maybe we think about them in a couple of months. Um, so just going back to that holding group um, point, I think maybe this is something you guys might know, but it's really important. Um, so I wanted to pop it in here. So Agencies across the world are in families, which are holding groups. Um, and we have the big four there at the top in pink. So Publicist, WPP, Omnicom, and IPG. And I've listed some of the agencies within, within those groups for you. Um, these guys at the bottom are smaller holding groups. Um, so they're still equally as important, but they're, just don't, they're not quite as big family. Um, so this is good for us to know because you can, again, look for trends and opportunities using like this knowledge that you have. So if you see a tweet that says WPP making global redundancies, that might sort of cross Gray, Ogilvy, Wonderman, uh, BMO Weiner and AKQA off for now. Um, or if you see that Omnicom has um, registered like massive profits, then they're, again, quite good tar um, target agencies for you. Um, and further down your career, this, you, you'll become more of aware of these groups as well because families don't, they don't take from each other. So, um, for example, if you're a creative at a &B, your next job couldn't be at Adam and Eve. They don't hire within the families. 
So this is just something for you to be aware of um, and useful when we're looking at these trends and opportunities within the market. So you can use this as a bit of a checklist. Um, so, I mean, the most important thing when you're thinking about approaching agencies is do you like their work? If you don't like their work, then it's never going to work. <laughs> Um, who's their ECD and CD? Can you learn from them? Because that's what you should be doing for your whole career, really. But this is the most important part for you to be doing that. Um, like I just said, are they in a holding group? Is that holding group in good shape? Um, have they made redundancies um, lately? You'll be able to find, again, this information out from Twitter, um, from Campaign and Little Black Book. Have they lost clients? Have they won clients? That will um, tell you what sort of shape that agency is in. Um, and who are their clients? Like, are they making work? Um, so obviously this year, especially, there's been a lot of people who haven't been, you know, the BA account, that's a quiet one for 2020. So really think about who those people's clients are and what's the likelihood of them going, you know, making work. Um, so look, let's go to our, our journey. We've got an amazing book, it's good to go. Um, we found an agency that we want to approach. They tick all of these boxes. And for this, we're gonna call that agency Richardson & Co. Um, so how do we approach them? Who are we looking to talk to within them? And how do we go about it? So the people that you should be targeting within agencies, especially for placements, um, is midway teams. So these guys are um, people a few years on from you who have asked for a bit more responsibility in their role. So they're often given the job to find placement teams um, or placement creatives um, and run the scheme within the agency. So these are really good people for you to start to get to know. These are the guys that will be most open to giving you book crits as well. Um, Creative directors, creative services, internal recruiters are also really helpful. Um, if they can't help directly, they'll at least be able to point you into the um, direction that, of someone who will. Um, and use your networks. You know, if you've just finished ad school, try and find someone a few years ahead of you who's already in an agency that you like and see if they can help. Um, use like DNA D shift if you've been through that. So just try and be a little bit cleverer and broaden your, your net a little bit of who might be able to help you. Um, when you are looking for the emails of these people, I think a lot of people don't realize this, but for a business, email addresses always follow the same um, pattern. So ours at the talent business, for example, is first name dot last name at the talent business.com. So if you have my email address and you want to get in touch with, my colleague Will, and you know his name is Will Knox, you know that his email address is will.knox at thetalentbusiness.com. So if you find one agency email, then you can figure out the email of the person you need. Um, follow these people on Twitter, you know, like that whole piece I just did, people put news up there and you, it will help you get a really well um, rounded uh, view of the industry. Um, and how to approach them, this is so important. You know, if you're dropping these people emails, I swear, I hope you're well will, can be the difference between getting a reply and not getting a reply. Um, it's astounding the amount of emails I get, which are, hi Anna, and then it jumps into exactly what they want from me, which is fine, but it kind of sets, it sets a bit of a tone and I reply, but a lot of people wouldn't. So, just do the niceties at the beginning and it will make such a difference. Um, maybe mention a piece of work that you've seen and you like from that agency. Um, obviously include your availability and a link to your book. Um, don't copy and paste these. Um, you probably will be, you might be emailing a creative director and a midway team in the same agency. So don't copy and paste the same, the same email to them try and make them as bespoke as you can. Um, and this unfortunately is something definitely that's important for this year, um, but be sympathetic when you're writing to these people. Um, you know, these people might have had the worst day by the time that you guys land in their inbox. They could have made people redundant. They could have been working on a pitch that they didn't win. They could have lost a client. So 
unfortunately for this year, you know, the tone, the tone of your email just needs to reflect that. Just make sure you're being sympathetic um, to, um, you know, when you're asking these people for help. Um, and that's a really good point. People this year really do want to help. We're also sympathetic to the position that you guys are in, um, which means that the, the, the market and the industry is really pulling together. So use that to your, you know, to your benefit. Um, try and get something out of each interaction you have. You know, they might not be looking for a junior creative at the moment, or they might not be able to offer you a placement, but could you have a 30 minute quit with them over Zoom? Or could they introduce you to someone who would be, um, would be up for doing a crit? Or if you really, really, really like them, could that person be like a mentor to you going forward over the next few months or a year and help you? Um, so yeah, I think maybe like one or two mentors is enough though. You don't want to be asking everyone you talk to to be a mentor. Um, but that's how I would go about, go about chatting to people. And just really quickly in this section, I wanted to talk about upskilling. Um, because like I said, we've all got a little bit more time maybe at the moment. Hopefully your portfolio is beautiful and it's done. So you might have a bit more time on your hands. Um, and these are a few things that you could do. Again, all of these things are free. Um, so maybe increase your chances of, of landing something. Um, if you're an art director, can you do some Photoshop tutorials? Can you sit on YouTube for a little while and um, learn how to execute your ideas to a higher standard that might set you apart from someone else? Um, social, it sounds ridiculous, but go and sit on TikTok for a little while. Um, social is something that creative directors in, like, expect young talent these days to inherently know about. Um, these guys have been in the industry for maybe 20, 30 years and they know how to write a good TV ad, but they know, don't necessarily how to know how to use Instagram or Snapchat to, like, to ex execute some of their ideas. Um, and they'll look to you to know. So go and sit on TikTok for a few hours um, and maybe put a few social ideas in your portfolio as well. Um, culture, again, um, a lot of creative directors are looking for young talent to um, have those cultural references. More and more clients want to do uh, work that really resonates within culture. So have some references ready and really be embedded. Um, like I said, these guys know how to make proper traditional ads. So, you know, use, the, use this time to, to bring all those other things together um, and just make, make, make. Be a maker, be a creator, direct a film, a short, a short film, not an actual film, um, do some photography, write, like all of these things in your book um, will, will really, really help, really help your chances of getting something. Um, so where are we up to? So we've approached Richardson and Co. We've had an interview, they love us, they want us to, they want to bring us in. Um, but how are we going to, how are going to be paid? What are we going to be paid? So as you probably know, um, the placement poverty pledge is there to ensure that anyone on a placement is, um, earning the living wage in London. That's a little bit higher than the rest of the UK. Um, they've got tons of people signed up as you can see, and this is across the country as well. This isn't just London. Um, after three months service, you, so three months on placement, you should be put on a day rate of £100. But this is something that I've seen agencies not be that good at. So make sure once you've been somewhere for three months, you, you're converted onto £100 a day. Because it, it will make a difference. And that is what they've signed up to do. So make sure they do it. Um, and on placement, you're, you're also entitled to holiday, which a lot of people, people didn't know. Um, but look, Richardson Co, we've nailed our placement. We've been there three months. We've absolutely smashed it. And now they want to hire us permanently. So let's talk about how we would negotiate our initial salary. And there's no secret um, formula for this. The, the most important thing when you're negotiating salaries is just tell them the truth and tell them the exact number that you're looking for. Um, and I've got some numbers in a minute. 
Um, but just never lie. It, it always comes out. Um, if you're in a role currently and you're negotiating with a new agency, the day you turn up and give them your P45, they'll know that you've lied about what salary you're on at your previous agency. And it just leaves a really bad taste in people's mouths. Um, a lot of people try and play a bit of a game at this stage and say if they want 30 grand, they'll say 33. Um, it's a really risky, risky game to get into. Um, I would advise against it. If you want 30K, tell them you want 30K. Um, it, it, will, it will work out a lot easier um, further down the line. Um, but again, look, don't follow the money. We should be thinking about the work. And that's what we should follow. And we should follow that thread throughout our, throughout our career. Um, but I've seen offers fall through at this stage when people have, have over-egged it and been a little bit too greedy. So just have a really honest conversation with these people. Um, so you've been there a year. Richardson Co is still great. We love it. Um, we want to ask for a pay rise. So pay rise is that it's not a given that you're gonna get one each year. It's nice if you do, but it's not set in stone. Um, and it's not personal if you don't. It depends on so many factors. Um, you know, the current state of the agency, what's their budget like? Have they lost clients? Have they gained clients? Um, pay gaps, we're gonna see this a lot more. Obviously people are trying to even up things like gender pay gap. So that might, they might be maybe giving someone else a pay rise to even them up, um, or you a pay rise to even you up. Um, Bandings, so salary bandings is something that we see a lot in um, the in-house agency structure. Um, so there'll be a certain salary level that you can reach uh, at your weight before you have to be promoted to sort of like a senior or a mid. Um, but my best advice for this is keeping a, like a working document through the year. So make a list of things that you think um, could be a reason for giving you a pay rise. If you've worked on a pitch and your idea nearly got bought, nearly won the pitch, then pop that on the list. If you've won awards, pop that on the list. Um, if you've presented your work to client, which is a bit above and beyond because you're a junior, put that on the list. So this just gives you a bit of fuel. If you go into these meetings, it gives you some things straight off the bat um, that you can start to talk about. And it's just good for your confidence going into that meeting, knowing that you've had a good year. Um, but look, people, oh, so I'd say, sorry, if you are gonna get a pay rise, around sort of 10 to 15%, maybe a year, that's good. That's maybe what you should be asking for, um, but don't deviate too far above that. Um, but yeah, people don't, don't wanna screw you over in our industry. People are genuinely always trying to pay you as much as they can afford. Um, it just does depend on all these factors we've talked about. So it's not you against the world. You know, people are trying to help out. So now this is um, some figures that maybe we could, we could expect on each weight. So if you're on placement, obviously the, P, the three P's there is placement, poverty, pledge. Um, but I think, you know, if you're negotiating, once you start to think about getting a junior job, your starting salary should be somewhere between, this is in London, um, 25 to 30K. Um, and then you sort of, you, you go up and you can see how it's, it progresses. Uh, if the numbers in brackets are freelance day rates, if that's something you, you start, start to think about going down that route, this will give you a bit of a guide. Um, but this is very broad. Uh, it obviously depends on the kind of agency you're in, um, the size of it, and like I said, how they're doing um, in terms of the business as a whole. So, where are we at? We found the perfect agency in Richardson & Co. We've negotiated our starting salary, but now they've sent us the contract and we don't know what to look for in it. Um, so here are some things that we need to look out for. Now contracts are worded so difficultly. Um, so they can be really confusing to navigate your way through. Um, if you're on placement and you're not offered a contract, then ask for one. Um, and these on the left hand side are the kinds of things that you will have included on a placement contract. And then with a perm contract, you'll have all of these things. 
um, plus others, but these are the ones I get asked about most often. Um, so the pink bits are the bits that I, um, I'm always asked about and I'm going to sort of embellish on. So what I've done is I've taken extracts from a real contract, which is so wordy and legal, um, and I'm going to sort of put it into normal, normal words for you. So working for third parties. So the contract might say, the employee shall not undertake any employment for third parties without written permission of the employer and shall not receive any financial benefit from third parties. So this, all this is essentially saying is if you are permanently employed by Richardson & Co, um, you can't freelance on the side. You can only work for them, which sounds quite obvious, um, but quite a few people um, ha have tried to do that over the past few years. So if you're permanently hired by someone, you only work for them, okay? The next one is notice period. Um, if you're on placement, you'll have a notice period. Um, it's normally a week, either way. And either way means you have to give them a week's notice and Richardson Co have to give you a week's notice. So it goes both ways. Um, when you're hired as a junior, this will probably be a month. Sometimes it's six weeks, but a month is a good guide. I think six weeks, six weeks as a junior is a bit mean. Um, and then it will start to get a bit longer as you progress throughout your career. So maybe, I think by the time you go up to three months, you'll probably be a senior. Um, so these protect you as well. So this is um, not something to be scared of. This is, um, this is really protecting you as much as it's protecting the agency. I get asked about this one a lot. So this is um, post-termination restrictions. So it just means once you've left the agency, what you can and can't do. Um, now this really, you probably won't have to worry about until you get to sort of CD, ECD level. Um, it's not something we need to focus too much on as a junior, uh, but it's good for you to know. So it just essentially means that if you leave for the six months after you um, after your termination date, you can't try and steal any of their clients or steal any of their key people um, or be employed by uh, one of their clients. So it's good for you to know, but I don't think we should worry about this too much right now. This next one, however, is super important. So this is confidentiality and this is protecting um, the agency. Um, so this will say something like, the employee shall maintain strict confidentiality towards third parties during and after a period of employment concerning everything he or she learns during their employment. So this, what this means for you is you need to be careful what you're saying at the pub. <laughs> you need to be careful what you're saying to your mates in other agencies. Um, if you go for an interview, obviously be careful about what you're saying, about what your current work. Um, and where this really stings people is the sharing of work that hasn't gone live yet. So until work that you've produced at an agency or at a business is in the public domain, you cannot put it on your portfolio. Um, and I've seen people be fired over this. So this is really, really important for you to understand. Um, and then the final point that sometimes tricks people is intellectual property. So this little list here I've got, I've cut down a lot. Um, but it essentially means that anything you produce at an agency is owned by them. So Richardson & Co will have the rights to that work, be that any of these things. So advertising, promotional ideas, inventions, art, copy, music, slogans, trademarks, products, drawings, models, discoveries, charts, diagrams, data, names. The list was huge. It was like half a page on this contract. So it's obviously your work and your idea and you'll be credited on it but you don't technically own the intellectual property. So it all belongs to Richardson & Co. So that's a really important thing to try and, try and get your head around. Um, so the last thing I'm gonna mention in this is um, opting out. So this is something that you, will be, you might be given along with a contract. Um, so this essentially is the agency just getting you to waive um, the working time regulations law 
um, which says you can't work more than 48 hours a week. So this isn't them saying that you will every week be asked to work more than 48 hours. It's just saying that sometimes you might be. Um, and those times will be things like pitching and shoots. So it's not going to be every single week. If you're going to be chained to your desk for 70 hours and this is you waving your right to leave. It's not that at all. It's just saying that you'll be willing to do it if asked. Um, so this is just covering them. But that's it. We're good to go. So we've got a job. Congratulations. <laughs> We're now employed as junior creative at the Richardson & Co. So we've done everything. We've tailored our book. We have found them using trends and stuff on Twitter. We've approached them. We've negotiated. We've sorted out a contract, even though it's confusing along. Um, so that's the end of the process, really. And then you start. So just looking sort of into the future and some key takeaways that I want you to take from this, really. Really start using these things to your, to your benefit. Like look for opportunities, look for trends. It will just make the whole process feel so much easier for you because you're being clever about who you're approaching. Um, try to get something from every interaction. Like I said, if it can't be a job or a placement, then could they give you a crit um, or maybe potentially be a mentor to you? Um, throughout your career, you should never, ever follow money. Always follow people and the work, the work you want to make and the people you want to make it for and with. Um, and just make, make, make. I get asked on a daily basis for people to find them makers. So just be a maker. You are a creative, so be a creative um, and make as much as you can.